I think sometimes we uh, judge things with the wrong criteria. Uh, I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I was watching an NFL game. It was between the Dolphins and the Broncos, and I hadn't seen the, the Dolphins play this year. And so at the beginning of the game, they flash over to the sidelines and they show the Dolphins coach, uh, Mike McDaniel. And I thought, man, he looks small. Like I'm used to like Andy Reid looks like an NFL coach, right? Or Bill Belichick. And, and I found myself thinking, I, I, wonder what, I wonder if he knows much about football. Like I wonder if he's going to be able to do very well today against the Broncos. Arguably not very tough competition this year, but... And then he goes on and he scores 70 points against the Broncos. And I thought, well, I, okay, he knows a little bit about football. And, the, and then the, the cool thing about that game, if you watch this, is they were on the 27-yard line and had an opportunity to kick a field goal and break the all-time record of points scored against an opponent in a game. And they took a knee. And I'm like, this guy does know football. So I was judging him based on, I'm admitting, the wrong criteria, like how he looks compared to Andy Reid, who is, I think, the, the perfect football coach. So we can make judgments based on the wrong criteria. I say that because I think we do that in the church, too. I think we do that in Christendom. I think we tend to think about uh, who we would say the most successful leaders are or workers in the church. And I think we tend to think of those people that are high performance, that achieve at a, at a high level. I think we think about people that have big personalities, uh, big following. We, we think in terms of those people. And uh, I, I will admit to you, uh, I, the problem with this, in my opinion, is... Uh, I think we're perpetuating this idea that the church is a place where only a few people should be in leadership. And those, those people are uh, the high performers, high achievers, kind of the charismatic type. And I think what that ends up doing is causing the rest of the people in the body of Christ to feel like, I shouldn't even start, shouldn't even try. I won't achieve at that level. I don't have that personality. And I think that does great damage to the church. I'll be honest with you, I know these feelings firsthand because of a few, I can give you a lot of reasons, but uh, when my wife and I were leaving L.A., uh, I was just about to graduate seminary, and we had accepted a position in Ames, Iowa to start a college group there. And the church flew us back for a weekend where we could kind of look at houses and they pulled together about 10 students, and it happened to be a weekend that they were doing all campus ministries came together. In fact, Iowa also came over and joined, and so it was an all-campus ministry event, and there were about 3,000 people there for this, this big night of worship. And, and so this is about two months before I moved to Ames to start a college ministry, and I'll tell you, it was, it was a powerful night. The music was like a rock concert. Like it was just loud and dynamic. And, and then this guy gets up to speak. And he's about my age. So that would have been about 30 at the time. And I'm not sure to this day I've heard anybody who's a more dynamic speaker than this guy. Uh, he was fantastic at speaking. He was like John Piper and Francis Chan and Matt Chandler, like all rolled into one. Like incredible. At, at speaking. And uh, not only that, but he just looked cool. Like, yeah, I remember he had like the perfect pair of leather boots and like his jeans were perfectly faded and just a good looking guy. And he could, the way he talked, he could get you laughing with him in one moment and crying in the next. And that cycle probably happened like, I don't know, 20 times in 30 minutes. Just a really outstanding speaker. I probably would have rededicated my life to God that night, whether I needed to or not, like that kind of a guy. And, um, but I'll be honest with you, I did not sit there and listen to him preach in order to hear from God. I sat there and listened to him preach, and all I did was judge my 
performance against his. Which meant that for 30 minutes, and it just built, I felt more and more insecure. Here I am finishing homiletics class, and I've never met anybody at Talbot that preached like this guy, right? And uh, for 30 minutes, I became more and more insecure. And uh, I remember one of the students that was with me, the, the preacher wraps up, prays, and then the student leans over to me and says, that's what we want you to do. And what I wanted to do was climb under my chair and, like, never come out. I wanted to quit, and I hadn't even started yet. Uh, but I, I bring that up because I think that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. And this is what we're perpetuating, this idea that when it comes to the question of who's God looking for, right? Who does God want to, to advance the gospel, to do the work of the church? I think we tend to think in the criteria of, well, who's dynamic, who's outgoing, who has big followings, you know, and those types of things. Could that criteria be wrong? I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians 3, if you haven't turned there yet. Ephesians 3. While you're turning, I I think it's important for this passage in particular to kind of understand the flow of thought. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13, is an aside it's, an, it's a diversion from the flow of thought that Paul is in. It's as if Paul is saying something like, before we go on, let me say this. Okay, so it's an aside. Just to kind of put us back into the flow of thought, chapters 1 and 2 are basically Paul praising God, inviting the church to praise God for the work that he is doing through Jesus what Jesus went through on the cross. Chapter 2 ends, if you'll remember last week, we talked about how it ends with this, this beautiful picture of how because of the bloody, violent death that Jesus experienced on the cross, right, the blood of Christ, that Jesus has tore down the dividing wall between the nation of Israel and the Gentile nations. We talked about how to the nation of Israel, obviously there are several different people groups and ethnicities at that time, but you were either Jewish or you were a Gentile. And we looked at how much of the first covenant, right, the old covenant was designed to really help them be distinct from the Gentiles, to be separate from. And so chapter 2 is really celebrating how through that single act of the cross, Jesus tore down that dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And through the new covenant in his blood, he created a new humanity. Like one people, one family for God. And this one family gives equal access to anyone from Israel and anyone not from Israel if they will put their faith in Jesus. And so that's the end of chapter 2. And it's really the beginning of chapter 3, that first phrase in chapter 3, verse 1, is where Paul breaks. In fact, it makes it very obvious here. If you look at chapter 3, verse 1, it says, for this reason. And then if you look at, this is where Paul brings it back into the flow of thought. Look at verse 14. Paul comes right back to that. He says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. So the for this reason that he's beginning in verse three or in verse one, he completes that phrase in verse 14. So everything from for that reason, this reason in verse one, up into verse 14, that is the aside. Right? That's Paul saying, Oh, wait, before we go on. I want to say this. Now, what's the aside? Why is it that important that I would kind of point it out like this? Well, look with me at verse 1. It says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. He's, he, stop right there for a second. So the aside begins with Paul bringing up his imprisonment. Uh, You'll remember he's in in prison in Rome, so this would be 
likely his first imprisonment, AD 60 to 62. But he breaks the flow of thought to bring up his imprisonment. And some have asked the question, well, why would he do that? What's, what's the point of this aside? And some have suggested that, well, Paul is defending his apostleship here. Right? Like he's, he's trying to remind them that he's an apostle so that they take his words seriously. I don't think that's it at all. I don't think that his apostleship was really in question. And I think to even think in that category of why this aside is to miss the actual point of the passage, Paul is taking this aside because he doesn't want the Ephesians to judge his situation by the wrong criteria. Or they're going to miss what, what he is doing. He's going, they're going to miss what God is doing through Paul's sufferings. Let's look at what Paul says. He says he's in chains in Rome on behalf of the Gentiles. Remember this imprisonment. Like Paul is in Rome because there was a group of religious, zealot Jewish leaders that were traveling around everywhere Paul went on his missionary travels. They were going there to try to oppose him, to try to get him arrested, ideally to get him stoned to death. He did get stoned, but he's in prison in Rome because many of his Jewish countrymen have, have heard his message. Remember, Paul starts out in the synagogues in all these places, and he preaches Christ there. But then when he's turned away from the synagogue, he goes out and he preaches it to Gentiles. And then uh, the nation of Israel, these Jewish leaders, are seeing that the Gentiles, according to Paul's gospel have equal access to their God, right? The, the God of the nation of Israel. And they hate it. And so they're following Paul around, and this led to his imprisonment in Rome. And uh, so Paul's, so here's what's going on with this aside. Paul is in the middle of this long, extended praise about God and his gospel and how powerful it is and how eternal it is, and how it will not be stopped. There's nothing that can stop the gospel advancing and the church being built. But yet the elephant in the room is that But Paul's in prison. Uh, Paul's not in front of any large crowds. Uh, A lot of the things that we today and they in this day would look at and say, wow, that's a dynamic leader out in front of a dynamic movement that has to be of God. That's not true with Paul here. He's chained up. It's by himself. He's in prison. Doesn't have any freedoms. Very little. It's house arrest. No super cool boots. No jeans. No large crowds. In fact, no no charisma. No, No great speaking ability. No great appearance whatsoever. You'll remember what uh, the Corinthians were saying about Paul? And this wasn't just true about Paul in Corinth. This was true about Paul wherever Paul went. The Corinthians were saying about Paul that his personal appearance is like sickly, like weak. And his speech, the way he talks, is uh, contemptible. Like it's, it's disgusting. And, and so the Corinthians were struggling with this very same thing too. They were kind of weighing Paul out as an orator comparing him to all the other orators. That was the big deal in that day. And they're like, he's not anything to look at. And then he starts talking and it gets worse, right? So not only does he not have boots or cool jeans, he's not good to look at and he doesn't speak very well. And that's when he's free. He's in prison. And so this is the aside, right? Like, God is amazing. The gospel is bringing Jews and Gentiles together. God is building one house, one humanity. This this is the glories and the power of God that you're seeing at work. But but yeah, I know that you know I'm in prison. And I've got none of this. I've got, you know, I've got none of this stuff that you'd look at and say, wow, there's a great movement afoot here, and God's behind it. And so I, I would say to you the, the real clear statement of why Paul is writing this aside shows up at the very end when he pulls us out of the aside. Uh, look at verse 13 with me. 
He says, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So he's writing this aside to talk about his imprisonment so that these believers that he loves in Ephesus don't don't use the wrong criteria to judge his situation, to judge his sufferings that might take them away from, I would say, seeing God correctly and and having faith in the right things and in, in what is true. So with all of that to kind of frame this aside, let's actually look at what Paul says to the Ephesians about why not to lose heart about his sufferings. Look at uh, verses 2 and 3. He says, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. To understand the encouragement, we need to understand what Paul means by mystery. This is a This is a very precise idea when Paul says mystery, and it shows up in other letters as well. Mystery to Paul is something that has always been known by God. It's it's always been the plan of God, but it's something that God in his own timing, according to his will, didn't necessarily reveal it to all generations. Mystery is something that has always been true for God, but, but not necessarily understood by each generation. And this is really, I think, mystery is used by Paul like 27 times. And it's always according to this idea. God's always known and God's always planned, but people haven't always been able to see it. In fact, if you look at verse 3, this is what Paul is saying. He says, the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Now, that sounds spiritual, but You remember the moment when the mystery was made known to Paul by revelation? It's when he got knocked off his horse and blinded. And in the days that followed, when God directly, and there's some mystery to that, God directly revealed the the mystery to Paul, and uh, which created his apostleship. So it's something that, that even in Paul's lifetime... Uh, This idea that it's not revealed necessarily uh, until a certain point. Paul spent a good amount of his life without even knowing the mystery. And then God showed up and revealed it to him. And then we also see that in verses 4 and 5. We see that the mystery is something that was not known like throughout the Old Testament. It was made known at the time of the apostles. So look at 4 and 5. He says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. No amount of study of the scripture, memorizing the scripture would have led somebody to seeing this mystery. This was something that was revealed by God through the Spirit at the time in which God uh, chose to reveal it, is Paul's point. So what's the mystery? We see that very clearly in verse 6. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now this is what we talked about last week, and so we won't spend much time on it, but The mystery that Paul didn't know until God revealed it to him was this idea that Jesus, right? He's the the long-awaited king of Israel. He's the Israel king to sit on the seat of of David's throne. He's the Messiah. He's the one that, that Israel had been awaiting to be their Messiah. This Jesus, it was revealed to Paul, is actually equally the king of everybody. And he's equally the savior of the entire world. Jews and Gentiles, anyone that would put their faith in Jesus, has equal access to the Father through the same Spirit. And this is, this is the mystery that was revealed to Paul. And uh, so verses 10, 7 through 10, and we're just going to read this and then we'll kind of back up and look at it real quickly. 
Verses 7 through 10 is really Paul giving thanks and giving testimony to how God put Paul right in the center of this mystery being preached. Um, You'll see Paul feels very undeserving of this. Uh, Very grateful, but very undeserving of this opportunity to not just see the mystery, but to be able to preach the mystery to Gentiles. Uh, Look at 7 through 10. It says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We'll just continue. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So here's his point. I mentioned that this is an aside so that they don't lose heart. They don't misjudge, right, uh, his situation as something that might hurt their trust in God. So the point is that you can look at Paul's situation. You can look at his his, uh, imprisonment. You can look at his sufferings. You can look at the fact he's been stoned. He's been beaten. They knew all of these things. And you could look at that and you could say that is a sign of something outside of the will of God, something outside of what God is doing. And really something you would call other than blessing for Paul. But that would be to misjudge. That would be to look at the wrong criteria because if you look at verse 7, Paul says all of that is a part of the gift of God's grace to Paul. Now, the, the gift of God's grace, the way that reads is all of that is a part of the good, gracious assignment that Paul has been given by God. But, but he's, he's saying the assignment to preach the mystery of Christ to the Gentiles, that is a part of, that's, that's the, the reason God is doing this with Paul's imprisonment. But he calls it a gift. So if you're going to judge imprisonment or you're going to judge sufferings, you're going to use the wrong grid to judge success, you're going to, you won't be thinking with God about what What's happening with Paul here? And again, to use the wrong criteria, you're going to look at Paul's situation. You're going to say, well, that's weak, right? That's foolish. But if you look at verse 7 again, what we might think is weak, Paul says is actually the working of his power. We're going to come back to a passage in the benediction, but one of the clearest themes in the scripture, scriptures in the New Testament is that the power of God is seen and made perfect through our weaknesses, our sufferings. So Paul's like, if you're going to judge success based on, you know, my strength and my abilities and my freedoms and all of those things, you're going to miss the fact that what I'm going through right now is displaying the working of God's power. And again, to judge by the wrong criteria, you're going to look at what Paul is going through and you're going to think it's, it's fooly, foolish, like it's silly. It can't be a movement of God. You have a, a man that's under house arrest. But look at verse 9. Paul says what he's going through is bringing to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. He's saying, if you use the wrong criteria and you look at what's happening to me and you say, that's foolish, it's silly. This man's claiming to be a part of this huge movement of God to build a new humanity. 
And it's foolish. He's in prison. You're going you're gonna to miss the fact that what Paul is going through and what they are going through in Ephesus is actually displaying the manifold wisdom of God. And that's just a statement, again, that the way the world thinks, we tend to think of the gospel, right? The grace is foolishness. Um, we miss it. And then, again, the final thing is if you judge by the wrong criteria, you're likely to see what's happening with Paul, uh, all of his sufferings. You're likely to see that this whole message cannot be God. It's new, right? It's not, it's not the, the mystery wasn't revealed in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. This is a new covenant. Uh, it was made by the, the violent, bloody act of the cross. It's all new. It cannot be of God. Uh, but then, look at verse 11. Paul says, The eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. The eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't look at the cross and the new work of God, right? The new covenant made in the, in the blood of Christ. Uh, don't look at, at that new direction and say, that cannot be the same God. That cannot be the eternal purpose and plan of the one true God, the God of the Hebrew Scriptures, because you'll miss the fact that that was always God's plan. It wasn't a course correction down the road. It wasn't a new idea to God to uh, send His Son to live a perfect life, die on the cross, be buried, rise from the dead, to bring both Jews and Gentile believers together. That was the eternal purpose and plan of, of God, if, if you judge correctly. But you can see the point here. You can see how this aside is really Paul speaking to them and speaking to us today because we think the same way in this world. And he's inviting them to, to judge using the right criteria, to see what is true, to think about the grace of God and not kind of the world's way of thinking about what, what is success, what is, what is power, what proves that God is in it. Paul is inviting them to see that in, even in his sufferings, that that is exactly the work that God is doing. And he sees it as a gift. It's a grace from God that he gets to go through everything that he goes through to preach this mystery to the Gentiles. I do love how he ends in verse 13, this little aside. He says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So all that to say, what he's going through is imprisonments and all of that. He's saying, look at that and realize that's how you're receiving the gospel. Right? That's how you have found Christ is your Savior, just like many from the nation of Israel. See, the enemy of the gospel in Paul's day, I think it's really important to realize, it's not, it's not people. This is why the Bible says our battle is not against flesh and blood. The enemy of the gospel, right, the idea of the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ is still the enemy of the gospel today. And if I had to choose one word to describe this enemy, I would choose the word legalism. But I mean something very specific by legalism. Legalism, though, is what keeps us from seeing and believing and enjoying the grace of God. Legalism, just to kind of define it, that's, it's really the system whereby one measures... Uh, against other people. One measures their standing before God, they, their standing before their community. I think most of the measuring is how we feel about ourselves. But legalism is, is when you measure your sense of self, right? Your righteousness or your, your worth. You find your worth in the things that you do 
or the things that you don't do. So legalism by nature is, is, a, is a mindset of a bunch of lines that, you know, to, to be better than others, to feel good about myself, I need to not do these things, I need to do these things. And within the legalist mindset, every person out there on some level is competition. Because you have to have something that takes it from abstract to concrete, and so people become the measuring sticks. And this can be a spouse, right? It can be a sibling, it can be a teammate or a friend. We look and we say, okay, how, if I'm going to feel good about myself based on how I perform or what I accomplish, I need to know uh, how that is relative to other people. So it necessarily turns relationships into competition. But here's why I say it's, the, I think, the greatest enemy to enjoying grace, believing in the gospel, is that the person that's wrapped up in legalism is a person who cannot take their eyes off of what they're doing. They constantly look at what they do well, what they don't do well, how it compares to others. You know, am I, am I hitting the mark? Am I doing better? And it, it completely consumes the, the thoughts and the gaze of the person. And this is why I started the way I did I, this morning. I started with the coach, and I went on to talk about this in the church. I really do think that legalism, it's a very performance-based system of thinking of the Christian life. I do think legalism uniquely hurts the church in the way that it encourages those that are high achievers, high performers relative to others, right? Those who do have kind of naturally the gift of, of speaking, of commanding an audience. Maybe they have a lot of followers because people want to follow them. I think legalism encourages a lot of times those people to go for more, to take on more roles, to take on more leadership. I think there's the desire for more followers. Doesn't matter how big the following gets, that desire is going to, to grow and be there. Because I, I do think that there's some attractiveness to legalism. I think we're attracted to it. I think that there is a way that, man, if you focus, if you focus on what you do and you do things well, and that ends up kind of giving you a sense of, uh, you know what, I feel pretty good about myself relative to others. I think I'm doing well. I think I'm doing more for the church even. That can, in a twisted way, feel good. And I think that that kind of keeps, you know, those that are achieving well, I think that keeps them wanting to achieve more. But I think the overwhelming impact of legalism in the church is that it causes a great majority of Christians to sit back and do nothing. To like I admitted, right? Want to climb under my chair and never come out. Because before I even started the job, I did all that work, right? I, I, I prejudged myself. And if you would give me 10 lifetimes, I'd never speak as well as this, this guy. And, but I think legalism, this whole grid that we all foster, we all keep going, uh, ends up causing the majority of people to do that internal work of putting themselves on the bench because they're not going to... I could never speak like that. Right? I could never be that outgoing and that winsome and that gregarious and that successful. And so I will find a leader or two that is, and I'll find my identity in following them. And I think the whole thing is sick. I, I think the whole thing wounds the church. I hear Paul saying in this passage, but I hear him say it all throughout his letters because this is like the issue everywhere he goes. And the issue hasn't changed, but I hear him say all throughout the letters, man, count me out of all of that. Count me out of it. Don't, don't think of me in those categories. Other places he'll talk about this in terms of that, that's to regard a person according to the flesh, like how the world thinks. Don't think of me like that. I hear Paul saying, don't look at me and judge me and what God is doing through me based on my appearance, the boots that I wear, right, the jeans that I wear. Don't, don't judge me based on my speaking abilities. 
You know, don't judge me based on whether I'm, I'm a free person in a crowd with thousands of people listening to me or I'm in chains by myself with just an, you know, an ink pen and a piece of parchment. So don't judge me. Don't think about me in those categories whatsoever uh, because the gospel has, has freed me from that. By the way, I feel like I know Paul a little bit. I've said that before. Like, I feel like I know Paul in some ways. And I, I can tell you Paul is not saying these things from kind of a deep down where nobody sees part of his heart where he's just like, I just don't want to be judged, right? Like, I don't, he's not saying this because there's a part of him that hopes, you know what, if people get this and they think rightly and they, they're less critical, that it'll be better for his self-esteem or his self-worth. I don't think that's Paul at all. I, now, I'll say that I struggle with that, but I don't think that's Paul at all. I think Paul's concern is truly, if we think like that, we will miss the gospel. Like, we'll miss the grace of God. Like, that's when the joy of our salvation seeps out of us. Not that we lose Christ. But the more we drift back into legalism or performance-oriented Christianity, the less joy we have in Christ. Like, think about, think about the gospel. Think about the grace of God in the gospel. The grace of God in the gospel, and this is it, right? Salvation was accomplished by Christ through that violent act of dying on the cross. He willingly went through the cross, and the instrument of shame, and he did that to be the once and final uh, sacrifice for the wages of sin. So, you have faith in that death and in the blood of Christ. Your past, your present, and your future sins are all wiped clean. And, and not only that, but by, by grace, we are given the life of Jesus, so the righteousness of Christ. Uh, his account is now credited to our account, and our account was put on his back, which is why he died on the cross, now, if you think in terms of performance, what that means is in your good moments and in your bad moments, as a Christian, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That doesn't wax and wane. You have all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So he performed perfectly, and that's credited to your account, on your good days, on your bad days, and on those same good days and bad days, you, you have the absolute, complete forgiveness for all your sins. That's the grace. It cost him a great deal, but God gives that to us as a gift we receive by faith. But the way that that frees us, sets us free from the performance story, right? The, the legalism that we're all inclined to is when you believe in the gospel, you believe in the fact that your need to actually perform high and, and perform well and perform better than other people, that's gone. You're, you're believing that you have received the gift of perfect performance, right? Perfect righteousness that Jesus accomplished and his death. And you get to live in that grace. Changes how you look at yourself changes how you look at other people, changes how you feel and how you look at your relationship with God. Frankly, it is the wellspring that the Spirit, I believe, works within us by that grace. It becomes the motivation of why we wouldn't want to sin. We sin because we already feel dirty. When you don't feel dirty, when you feel clean because of the work of Christ, you don't want to sin. But this is grace. This is the gospel. And I hear Paul saying, you know, think of me in those terms. Think of the fact that, that the gospel of our salvation, our salvation was accomplished by a man who looked foolish to the world in that moment. He was naked. He was hanging on the instrument of shame. 
And through his death, he accomplished our salvation. That same salvation message, the gospel, Paul is saying, is going to be carried out in the world through people who are at times in prison, through people who are riddled with weaknesses, through people who still sin and still need that same grace, that same Savior. And it really does stress how we don't need to be impressive as Christians. We just need to love Jesus. We need to believe. We need to have faith in what he did for us. We need to think of the gospel and believe the gospel every moment of every day and treat each other accordingly to that. That's where I think the challenge is, like when I think about the week, is, is when you feel tempted and your thoughts tend to go the wrong direction, and they will for all of us, when we tend to think of that question, okay, who is God looking for? Who should the church, like, say, hey, jump in, help, you know? Who, who does God want to, to be advancing the gospel through? when you recognize your mind is starting to answer those questions with, oh, who's good at this, right? You know, who's good at speaking or who's outgoing or who walks into a room and, and commands an audience naturally? And when, when our minds go that direction, because they will, to, to see that is really dangerous. It's really potentially hurtful to our enjoyment of the gospel and of grace, yes, but it's really dangerous because those people might be head fakes. Those people might be peddling the gospel for their own building up through the performance story, right? Like they might be peddling the gospel in order to feel better about themselves. Maybe not. I ended up becoming friends with that speaker, and we're still friends. We still correspond. Sweet saint. We're both freed by grace. I don't have to compare myself to him anymore. Still a way better speaker. Uh, there are some people out there that are just really, you know, dynamic people that really love Jesus. But, but there's a likelihood that we'll make the wrong choices about who should be leading and who we should be following. But the main, the main reason I say this is because I think the majority of us feel, when we think in those categories, we think about legalism and performance, I think we keep ourselves on the bench. I think we tend to say, oh, I don't have it. I struggle with introversion. I don't like talking up front. What do I have to contribute to the gospel moving forward? And I just want to challenge you. When you feel those, think those thoughts, have those, those feelings, to again, come back to the grace of God. Come back to the fact that you could not please your Father in heaven more than how pleased he is with you because of the work of Christ at all times. And if you are a Christian in the body of Christ, who does God want to work through? Who is he wanting to get involved and advance the mission of the gospel? The ones who are just so believing in the grace of God through Christ that you just quit the performance story. You're like, I'm all in. I believe. I just want to tell people about what God did for me. It's every single one of you as Christians. And no one of us is more important to the church if we have Christ. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we do thank you uh, for just the gift of grace, uh, something we wouldn't have discovered or thought up on our own. That is also something that is only revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And but thank you for accomplishing our salvation. Thank you for the suffering and the humiliation that you went through. And thank you, like Paul is thanking you, thank you for our chance to be a part of the gospel going forward at times through our hardships and our weaknesses. And we give you all the glory and pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.
I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different for this time, this week. And uh, here in just a second, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for the benediction. I don't want anyone to uh, feel like I made eye contact with you at a certain word or point. So <laughs> it'll make sense in a second. But uh, yeah, if you close your eyes and then you can just keep them closed uh, as I finish with the scriptures. But I do want to ask, I just want you to ask to think for a moment about what you think or what you feel might be the thing that disadvantages you, the thing that uh, possibly makes you weaker than others or puts you at a disadvantage. So you could think about, you maybe you're somebody that struggled with weight from either direction. Or you're somebody that you feel too young, or you feel too old, or you, um, maybe you're dealing with cancer. Maybe you're somebody that has had a really hard time with being extroverted and maybe talking too much or being introverted and, and not being able to talk. Or There's a whole lot of ways, I think, that we tend to feel like we're not good enough, we're, we're not enough to be a part of something so glorious as the gospel and, and really showing people God. And I want you to think about that because this passage, I think, by the grace of God, turns our thinking on its, on its head. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul writes, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. He'll go on and say, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who has said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, the gospel, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And he goes on and he says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen.